Welcome to the Interzone, a show about the Microsoft 365 Intelligent Internet. I'm Mark Cashman here with my co-host Chris, back from the East Coast, McNulty. Thanks, Mark. You know, before I even say what we're talking about, I'll note that last week, for a diehard Red Sox fan like myself, I went to what some might regard as enemy territory, but of course, one of the hallowed places of baseball is Yankee Stadium. And the Red Sox were playing at Yankee Stadium, and it's a rivalry. So I decided to take the family. And what's really fascinating if you go to Yankee Stadium is there's just great history with a team that's been around as long as the Yankees. You know, there's a place in center field called Monument Park, and you can see all the legends of baseball. There's plaques for every one of them. And I feel like this week we're bringing so many of the legends of our community here on the show. We're going to be doing a panel discussion, not with Babe Ruth or Lou Gehrig or Mickey Mantle, but with four MVPs about what they've been doing with Microsoft's latest entry in the championship sweepstakes, Microsoft Viva. What are their experiences and best practices for each module, for a suite? What are the things that they've seen now that we're you know, about a half a year into the rollout of Viva? Let's talk about some of the lineup that we have here. Coming up to bat soon is Dux Raymond Sai. We're going to talk to him about Viva Connections. Susan Hanley about topics. Asif Ramani about learning. And Robert Molsau on Viva Insights. MVPs all about Viva implementation. You know, I think today our episode is really about going beyond what we at Microsoft tell you, which obviously we think is important and valuable, but to go into you know the real world and take it from the mouths of experts who have already been implementing these solutions and various combinations for dozens of customers. You know, what have they learned? What are some of the challenges, some of the tips and best practices? So if you want to be much more practical about getting Viva into the hands of your internal customers. This episode is for you. This is sort of the home run derby, if you will, with our MVPs about our employee experience platform, Microsoft Viva. I will now lay the bat down and avoid sports references for maybe four or five (laughs) episodes. I was going to say one last sports reference. We we had at bat who also hit a home run talking about Microsoft Viva. And just to lay a little foundation of where this conversation, we are hoping that it goes. We did have a talk with our CVP, Jared Spataro. And really, we focused on that being the 100 level to answer that question, what is Viva? So we will link that to in the show notes. If you haven't heard that episode, if you want to get that as a little precursor, uh, a little bit of uh, homework for you before. Before you listen to this entire episode, just know that we're really focused on not just what is Viva, uh, but really moving beyond that 100 level and getting into the two or 300 level. You know, how do I use this and how do I roll it out effectively throughout my organization? I have to remember, you know, Mark, we're not doing a Netflix program and people aren't necessarily joining us by going back to episode one, and watching every season forward. So <laughs> in case folks haven't done that, we should probably chat a little bit about just what is Microsoft Viva at the outset. Many people already know, but in case you don't, Viva, simply put, is Microsoft's employee experience platform delivered through Teams, looking to empower people and groups to achieve peak performance, taking a look at well-being and making sure that the capabilities that we've brought forward for Microsoft around automated knowledge integrated culture and community tools, workforce measurement and tools and tips and learning, all of those rich services alongside what our customers already have are woven into the fabric of Teams. That, in a nutshell, is Microsoft Viva. I think the last thing that you said, Chris, is a really important one, which I think will be that bridge of what this conversation is for today, which is taking advantage of what you already have. There are new capabilities and new technology that comes with Microsoft Viva, but it really builds on a lot of what a lot of our customers already have deployed, leveraging SharePoint for their intranet, leveraging some of the backend analytics capabilities for their individuals or teams that have been in existence for a while, but are getting uh, you know rolled up into this new category, but to build off of what people have done before to give them new capabilities. But also it's not a, a rip and replace. It's not a start from scratch for a lot of our customers. Having said that, 
We'll be talking about each of the modules of Viva with our MVPs. Mark, any additional thoughts before we kick it off? I've been doing a couple of demos and, and the broader focus of talking about hybrid work. A number of our customers are requesting some insights around how Microsoft is leveraging not just Viva, but how they are approaching getting back to work, how they're approaching this broader category of a better experience for people who aren't in the room or just a better experience where people are, are either wanting to work from home more effectively uh, or just the notion of the person that's en route, in travel, in motion, uh, that needs access to people and content and sometimes are right in the mix of the processes that have established. And a lot of those conversations um, at least the ones that are a little bit more NDA or one-to-one -one where you can show a few things but not necessarily fully publicize what you're showing. I've actually been leveraging more for my day-to-day -day, uh, with some of the modules that go beyond what I would have thought would be my core of experience. So I've been leveraging more of Viva Learning both to upskill, but also to show that a little bit more. A lot of people are wanting to know how can they put their own training and how can they leverage maybe some of the other services that they, they subscribe to. Just wanting to get the kind of the comfort of, yes, you can do that, but how do you do that? And I know we're going to talk about that with Asif, but that has been you know one area that people have been asking uh, me in representation of that hybrid work. How can people get skilled up from afar? Um, the other one is just me as an individual leveraging a lot more of the insights functionality. And this is the very much the new part of Viva, uh, Viva Insights that is not just telling me, you know, here's how you're working and some things you might want to do differently, but more of a reminder tool. I, I use a couple of things uh, as we've talked about on this show and I've, you know, blogged about in, in various ways that is just how does technology help you organize better? And I think it's that tap on the shoulder that says, <clears throat> you know, that conversation you had with so-and-so and you mentioned such and such, have you have you done that? Have you remembered to do that? There's a really nice part of insights that is kind of that checkpoint for me. Uh, and I showed that with a couple of customers uh, in the last few weeks. And that's really resonated where everybody, almost everybody on the call says, yeah, that, that would be super helpful. And so if anything, it's a thing I wanted to convey to you and, and to our audience is actually in using Viva beyond those core, you know, SharePoint backed elements of Viva has been hugely valuable to me and, and has resonated well with just the customer conversations that I've had in the context of hybrid work. Yeah, you know, I think it's really interesting if you play it forwards and backwards. You know, we at Microsoft, we create these applications and services and we put them out and we empower our customers and partners to implement them and understand tips and tricks. But I think it's really important to think it, you know, from the end backwards. Like, what is the transformation? What changes and how you go through your every day? And how does, you know, what do I need to do before that to make that successful? And what has to come before that? And I think understanding those end results is really important. Like we sort of launch things for Microsoft, but we have to really understand exactly how they land with users. The fact that we use this stuff internally is, I think, a key piece of getting that understanding. But, you know, our MVPs and our partners really accelerate that empathy not every organization has the resources of Microsoft, so it's important to figure out what works and what works best. Couldn't agree with you more. And I think to one last hook on your sports reference, I believe it is time to get your popcorn and Cracker Jacks and take us out to the ball game. Here we go. Conversation, depth about Viva implementation with Ducks, Susan, Asif, and Robert. So this is one of those things where it is kind of a shame that this is an audio only podcast because this is a lovely panel that we're staring at here for this recording. And you will see this if you go to the blog and check out the nice image of all of these great MVP faces. Um, but we want to welcome you audibly to the podcast. Welcome everybody to the Interzone. Um, I want to start with Sue. Do you want to take a moment and share a little bit about who you are and what you're doing these days? Sure. So uh, my name is Sue Hanley and I am an independent consultant, uh, information architect, and business analyst. And I spend most of my time helping organizations design and configure their intranet. So from design to governance and all things people related. 
Very nice. So if you're relating to people, you know the next panelist. And so let's hear from Ducks. Ducks, as Sue relates to you as a person, tell us a little bit about who is Ducks and what you're doing these days. Hey, Mark, thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity. And Sue just lives not too far from me, but we rarely see each other. My name is Ducks. I serve as the Chief Brand Officer at AppPoint and so grateful to be a Microsoft Regional Director MVP. And what I love doing is engaging with customers around the world and really making the most out of their investment in Microsoft 365, especially these days as they go back to the hybrid workplace. So it's a pleasure to be here. Nice to have that uh, value of customers as a lead into a lot of how you focus on, on approaching what they do and, of course, what AffPoint does. And if we were to hop across the pond, the pond being the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Robert, thanks for joining the IntraZone. Thanks a lot uh, for uh, being here. So great to see the guys, these bright guys. Um, yeah, I'm working for Context AI. We are yeah, helping customers to get the most of Office 365, especially to enabling the end users. Because we know um, everything is changing. This is the only constant we have. And a lot of people are ch uh, challenging with this or have challenges with that. So um, we unleash the power of everybody with data. And uh, this is what I'm doing as a chief evangelist. I like that concept of unleashing the power. So if we unleash the power of our last MVP, but certainly not the last in our minds, Asif, can you introduce yourself? First of all, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, my name is Asif Rahmani. I am the CEO of a company called Visual SP. And individually also, I've been an MVP with Microsoft since 2007. And I tell people when they ask me that the reason I believe at least that I've been an MVP for so long is that I love, love, love helping people and inf informing my audience. So I continue to do that. I've done that from back in the day for the dev audience, then the administrator, then the power user. And now I focus very much on the end user story, partnering very closely with Microsoft and focusing on Microsoft Office 365 and also Dynamics 365 to make sure that users are successful using those products. I'll talk more about that later also, but hey, thanks very much for having me. Great to be here. At this point, it's been about six months since we announced Microsoft Viva as our employee experience platform back in February. You know, during the past six months, Topics has gone to GA. We've rolled out connections. We've rolled out public previews for learning and for insights. I'd love to sort of go around the virtual table here and get your initial impression on what Viva is. What do you talk to customers about or what have you started using it for yourself? Let's start with Sue. Sure. So when I talk about Microsoft Viva, I really say that my absolute favorite thing about the announcement and everything I've done with it since then is how it encourages and enables a holistic conversation about what people need to get work done. And rather than saying, oh, we're gonna build an HR portal and you get all your HR stuff there, and we're gonna do an intranet, which typically is focused on comms and delivery of news. What we're basically now saying is, hey, you know, if you wanna get this employee experience right, you have to look at the employee from this holistic perspective and let's bring everybody together, IT, comms, HR, knowledge management and quality together to have these conversations so that we can put what people need to get work done, to learn, to manage their daily life in a place where they can get benefit from it without having to hop around the world. Ducks, what's Viva to you? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it's very timely, right? So during this time of pandemic and as organizations are looking into going back to work and thinking about hybrid work, the way I think of Viva and the way I, I explain it to a lot of customers, I tell them Viva is like your business graph where Microsoft has the Microsoft graph, Viva can serve as that business graph because it, it allows you from a hybrid work perspective, you can see and learn how effective your organization is. Viva can provide the pulse of how people are working together, how they interact with relevant assets to get their work done. So if I would put it in two words, Viva is the business graph for your organization. Kind of pivoting from the graph, let's kind of get your impression, Robert. What's, what's something you found yourself saying as you're describing Microsoft's ambitions for Viva in this space? It's actually, when, when I heard it first time, I was like uh, raising up the arms and then say, awesome. Finally, everything is focusing on the employee, on the people uh, with a whole platform. This is so important. And as I said, 
people are really struggling to um, yeah, keep pace with, with all the um, new changes. And therefore, it's so great to, to see Viva um, helping the users uh, to pick them up where they are, and especially with Viva Insights, uh, which is actually my personal favorite, of course. It's so great to, yeah, I usually say, People are going to work like um, they are cutting the grass in their garden. So it's kind of not super engaging activity, but also not disengaging. It's it's not engaged, it's neutral. And this is how uh, most people are also going to work, unfortunately. So it's just business as usual. And um, yeah, with Viva Insights, we can really unleash the power of all these yeah, not engaged people to increase their well-being, to uh, also coach the managers to coach their people. And this is really great how this is then bringing all together. Terrific. Asif, let's get your take before we broaden the discussion to look at Viva in depth. I want to build on what my fellow panelists have said. You know, in 2020 pandemic, it, it was more of a reactive year where people just went to the technologies that are going to help them with communication, training, and everything else in between. But now with 2021 is more of a proactive year, in my opinion. And that's where the employee experiences come into the picture. How do we, now the employees are there in Outlook, in Teams, especially in Teams, how do we help them in the flow of their work and in context of their environment? And I I look at Viva as not just the four apps that are out there that we're we're talking about here, but it's more of a brand in my mind. That's what I tell my customers. Uh, Microsoft is starting this brand to focus on employee experiences. And it's not, in my opinion, not going to stop here either. It's going to keep on building to bring, all, as Sue said, all the experiences holistically in one location where the people are already. So looking forward to the journey. Putting all the pieces of, of all of the feedback you've started with, each of you, you know, there is the big focus on people and there is the big focus of what does this mean for the whole of the organization at the level of the individual, the team, the team manager, and of course, leaders. And I ha- have to admit, Robert, when you were talking about cutting the lawn, this is as if we're now implementing, you know, really nice barbecue uh, to be able to have those nice cut lawns, but to enjoy the time on the lawns, not not just to cut the grass. You know, whole, hearing how it's landing and, and certainly we know through what we hope through the MVP lens is the realistic uh, efforts that we're putting in, but how it lands and and how it comes together. I think the other uh, other uh, thing that I'm hearing is there's a lot of integration and hopefully it's a holistic experience for people, of course, bringing in a lot of different types of content and insights. Without us defining it, we want to get into the module level so that we can share with our audience what does it mean to actually implement Viva. Once you understand what it is, you're bought off on the value that it'll bring to actually make that real. So Sue, we wanted to start with you. Uh, We know that maybe even just getting started, but we know getting started with Viva Topics has to start somewhere and we know with you, it has been a history of working with knowledge and managing content and helping people organize. But if we look through the lens of Viva Topics, um, how do people get the most out of that? If you uh, can share what your approach is with what are the conversations with customers today, specifically around topics, but if, if there's more to topics in the conversation, we'd love to hear um, how people can get the most out of their information and content. Sure. So I just want to say that Viva Topics, when I was a the director of knowledge management for a global consultancy, Viva Topics is what I dreamed about. And so for me, this is, I mean, the potential of what you, the benefit of Viva Topics is exactly what I wish we could have done when this was sort of what I did every day, all day. But I think um, with Viva Topics, just like with all the Viva products, the most important thing to understand are really your organizational priorities. You know, there's a lot you can do with Viva, but focused on, especially with Viva topics, I think you really want to understand what the big rocks are for your organization. What are the key areas in which there are pain? What are the topics that are critically important for people to know about? Because when the AR starts generating 20,000 topics for your organization, you're going to have to prioritize on what is most important to um, focus on because the AI is great, but AI needs humans to make it even better. And, if, you know, from my perspective, of course, AI needs IA to make it even better than that. And so I think you want to really understand what's critical for our organization. What are the key products or programs or topics that are most important for 
for us to dedicate some cure, human curation to supplement what you get natively from Viva Topics, because you're just not going to be able to tackle it all at once. And so I think we want to decide, you know, where should we you know, focus our calories in order to get the biggest benefit from the amazing outcomes that we can achieve? So, Sue, I think that's spot on. You know, one of the things we've seen with some customers is there are some who look at Viva Topics and say, this is better than anything we've had before, and they start using it immediately. And we've also seen some of our customers who say, this is going to shift the way that we approach knowledge distribution since they already have a process. And so there's you know a little bit of a journey about mapping their patterns into the ways that Viva Topics sort of assumes that knowledge management should work. Um, have you seen that um, in your initial work with customers? Um, I think I've seen more that the topics themselves uh, need some human attention. And what organizations need to focus on is sort of immediately deciding from a governance perspective, at what point do we launch? Do we curate our most important topics to make sure that they are spot on before we go broad? Or you know, so in other words, do we pilot with a small group of people who are going to sort of be our knowledge managers, focus on the topics that we need to manage and curate, and then go wide so that when we launch, um, you're not seeing a suggested person who has absolutely nothing to do with that topic other than, you know, they wrote one, they created one page about it. I mean, again, this is where the AI and the people together um, work much better. Sometimes you see this relationship, you would have never known that that person has a degree of expertise in that topic had it not been suggested. And so, so from my perspective, I see that sort of, you know, figuring out the governance of how we want to start, how we want to launch is really the key decision and deployment strategy that I see in practice. And I have one just quick follow up that you got me thinking in terms of how people need to think and plan through what their topics are and what what their broader uh, organization style is. How does that if you were to look at the legacy or really the the current uh, methodology that you would put onto building a nice taxonomy? So if you need to make a robust term store so that you can apply those terms and leverage that for better organization of content. Do you see taxonomy as a similar parallel in the activity that you would do to create a really nice taxonomy that meets the business? And how do you think of that alongside topics? Yeah, I think 100% there's a huge alignment. And because when you're thinking about an organizational taxonomy, you do want to focus on what are those key attributes or values around which we want to organize our content. You know, that we want to give people the opportunity to consistently tag their content with these sort of organization-wide terms. And so they really can go together. Many, many organizations are building very successful internets without building an organizational taxonomy. And you can do that. But if you can combine um, a consistent taxonomy, a great IA, with the capabilities, with the way that the AI can leverage your IA to create better connections, you'll obviously have a better outcome. And so it's a teeny bit of a chicken and an egg, and it's a big um, thing to crack. And so I, that's why I'm saying, focus on your organizational priorities, focus your taxonomy on the attributes that are related to those priorities. And then you don't have to make this, it's a way to make a big, hairy, complex problem much smaller and manageable and doable. And then you can start seeing real benefits and real value much sooner. Robert, when we think about workplace analytics and now Viva Insights, it's really a tool that helps provide that coaching and visibility into how individuals are working, how people are working, what are the impacts on productivity and well-being. What are some of the best practices that you recommend to customers about getting insights established and about how it has the most benefits and drives the most usage and transformation across the culture? It's a very good question, especially with this sensitive topic in regards to aggregating data. Um, I would say many companies are simply not yet ready for that uh, because it's a cultural thing. Um, and then it's just putting an additional tool on it. We anyhow try to use it. So our, usually our first question is a cultural question. Do you switch on the camera during Teams meetings? 
Yes or no? And when people really try to avoid um, showing up in a virtual meeting, then it's a long way to also analyze how they work, with whom they work, and so on and so forth. So therefore, um, this is the first question to start. But this is uh, not a no-go, of course. It's just a longer way to go there. The best practice then to, to really establish and to roll out is then really similar, like Susan said, that um, prioritize first and then go wider and similar here. So start small and then dig deeper into the reports that you can get with workplace analytics behind Viva Insights. So I mean with this, um, don't give it to the managers first. Give it to the people first, <laughs> because this is the focus we want to set. This means um, I highly recommend to start with my insights. So use um, this virtual commute you can use every day. Use this meditation to, to brace, to really lower down your stress level if, if, if you are or if you feel stressed. Um, and you can also block time um, to, uh, to focus. When then the people get a kind of a feeling for um, what kind of data is, is aggregated and how it helps myself, then it's maybe the next step to um, yeah to enable also the uh, organizational white charts for the leaders. So my best example, which is usually um, um, eye-opening for for the folks uh, to whom I'm talking to, is this meeting culture. In every company, you have the complaint that we have so many big meetings and long meetings, and I don't really know if I'm needed there, there's no agenda, and so on and so forth. And this kind of information um, uh, can be made visible with Viva Insights. So this is then the next step to, to uh, look on the big organizational level. And then in the end, this was, in my opinion, uh, you can also enable these team manager charts uh, so that the managers get a kind of a reminder to have a regular one-on-one -on -one, uh, with their team to, to coach them on a regular basis, but also to check if the team is uh, trending to have some, some overwork and so are in danger to get a burnout or something like this so that the manager can proactively um, yeah, set some no meeting day, for example, or uh, plan some, some offsite to go for a nice outdoor activity. So these, yeah, I would say a stepped way, I would recommend is a, is a good way to establish and approach Viva Insights in the company. I was just going to observe, I always, we have a lot of the same practices internally at Microsoft. I'd say during the past um, 18 months, I'm always slightly amused when I hear that people are having an off-site day because hasn't every day been an off-site day? <laughs> From your perspective, um, as you're starting to leverage insights or talk to people about insights, there's, the, of course, the, the base component of my analytics and workplace analytics. When you start to talk to customers, are there the right levers where they are able to define what their workday is, what the thresholds of their workers are, based on then what you get from the system that's saying, you know, here is here is what we're seeing because of everybody's activity. Is there the right balance of what is the right business culture with what the AI is just kind of trying to tell you as raw data? There's not always a balance. So quite often when it's not measured, so, so far it's, uh, it's, it's mostly not measured, they just assume, they guess that people are doing fine. Oh, they can work from home so they can combine work and life and that they must feel great. Um, but, but they have no measurement in place. And therefore, quite often there's really kind of discrepancy that um, the data which is then showing up, oh, the people are really starting to work at seven and work till eight in the evening or something like this. Oh, they're in danger of burnout, for example. This is what then the data will really show. And customers are quite surprised then and say, oh, um, we were really in a kind of a blind flight. So we're really just guessing. Uh, but based on this data, um, we can now make proper decisions to, to help our people yeah, to, to feel better and yeah, also to be more productive and of course in the end. Yeah, I think the visual nature of being able to see where do I spend my time? And I think you're right to say you start with the people because they are going to make the decision. If I like that and I need to do that because of what I'm trying to achieve, then that's fine. There's nothing that's going to automatically shut off. But if you're getting this kind of insight into what you're doing and it is a little more than what you planned or, or what works for you, there are those reminders, uh, which I think is, is also very valuable. And I also think it aligns with something that Ducks had mentioned around the business graph. This really is the nature of the graph coming to life, but beyond content where it started, that it really starts to take in who do you work with, what do you work on, and now starting to at least promote 
ways that you might work differently that will benefit you mostly in the long term, but also for the culture. And so Ducks, if, if there's that graph element in insights, if we turn the conversation to Viva Connections, where we wanted to get your insights, uh, you know, the promise of it is this pre-configured company branded mobile first, customizable on and on targeting audiences, you know, a really nice jump start to getting your internet started. But what are some of the things that people need to know about what the back end is doing or what you need to configure to get what you want out of Viva Connections that really leads to what I think you would promote is this real use and engagement of however you might frame what, what Connections gives us. Before I jump into you know some of the key steps right, and best practices, I really want to uh, revalidate and reiterate what Robert and what Sue has talked about this is the culmination of what we've all dreamed of in the last 20 years. I know most of you weren't born 20 years ago yet, but this is what I was thinking about 20 years ago. Because Viva provides that fantastic opportunity now to reset how people think about corporate tools such as internets, HR systems, and file repositories, and specific to connections. Connections can knock down that constant context switching, or as Jared would put it, he spoke about this at Inspire last week, you know, these these digital cul-de-sacs, right? So we, we don't have to live there anymore and it can help improve the flow of work. And I think, especially in the last 18 months, this is very important where the lines are blurred now. Like, do I work from home or do I live in my office? So with, with connection, it's, it's going to help streamline all that because what it allows us to do is it makes that flow of work much more efficient and much more relevant to who I am, what I do in the organization. Now, this is assuming we uh, deploy it appropriately in a relevant way for your organization. How do we do that? How can we be effective? And these are the three key things I've learned as you know, deploying internally here at AppPoint, but also working with customers in their deployments. So when Viva first came out, fantastic features and functions. It's using SharePoint, Yammer. It's pulling in some of the key resources we already have, which is great. So I started that journey thinking about, oh, let's just hook all these things together. And again, time and again, I don't learn my lesson. I, I just stopped myself because as I went down that path, I forgot the most important thing, right? The first step is I need to center my implementation or my deployment of connections around people because it's not a one size fits all. So I started thinking about, okay, what are the most common use cases and tools that my colleagues rely on, be it Microsoft tools or not? And that's very important. So when we start our deployment here at AppPoint, you know, we love Microsoft technology. Certainly we use Yammer, we use SharePoint, we use Teams, but at the same time, we have other stuff we have our HR systems. We use Jira. We use, uh, you know, in, in the marketing organization I'm with, we use other technologies. And then I think about, well, the promise of Viva is reducing that context switching. How do I bring those in? And it may be different for HR. It may be different for accounting. So while we can't serve every single department right away, but at the very least, what are some of the most common resources that every single employee would need and use and how can we make that experience easier through these company branded environment that streamlines all of this. So what did we pick? We picked our internet, we picked our HR systems, we picked our travel systems. So that's the first thing, center your implementation around people, what are the most common use cases and bring those in along with the technologies that they use. Second is take what you currently have and make it available in, in Viva Connection. So again, we use Yammer, we use SharePoint, uh, we had our HR system, and you don't want to force new things right away. You know, if you look at the Viva Connections documentation, there's a great point that was made that, yeah, bring in Yammer communities because that will serve up a lot of the feeds, what's going on in the company. But the reality is not everybody uses Yammer today as much as we do, or as, as much as a lot of other organizations may have. So don't think that, oh, I'm gonna sneak Yammer in because we're gonna deploy Viva Connections and it'll be all hunky-dory and great. Uh, at least in my experience, what I've seen, uh, I can think of one company right now, that's what they did, didn't work quite too well. So not to say you're not 
going to use Yammer, but initially, as you start thinking about VBA connections, just pull in things that people are already using and then give them that streamlined experience. The third step or best practice as you implement this is you then constantly introduce new capabilities and light things up. It can be subtle. So for example, one of the subtle things we started lighting up soon after we rolled out connections is audience targeting. I know Mark, you talk about the targeting capability because one challenge we all face is we're drowning in the sea of information. And that's the challenge that all we have today, regardless if you're Microsoft or a smaller organization in, in another part of the world is, okay, where did I find that again? Where's that again? Oh, I need, you know, that TPS report. I don't know if Sue has it. So, but if, what if you target it to the right audience and this concept is nothing new. I mean, audience targeting has been around since what, SharePoint 2007 for that matter. Uh, but I love the targeting feature and then you can light that up. Now it's relevant, then you light up another thing. Maybe it's a good opportunity now to introduce Yammer to me. So really three things, right? Center around people, take what you have, roll it into connections, and then constantly introduce uh, new capabilities. Can I add something to what Ducks just said? I mean, in many ways, Ducks, you just described how to create a great intranet. Absent Viva connections, right? You, you should be doing all of those things. And great intranets have always done exactly that. And so what Viva Connections, I think the real value add to Viva Connections is it allows you to bring it where people are working. All that great work uh, in bring it into teams. And so, I, I mean, fundamentally, you just described how I would tell someone to build a great intranet, right? Well, that's what I was talking about. Like, this is a, my, our dream 20 years ago, right? The difference now compared to the intranet, and again, not, not bashing SharePoint 2000 or 2003, we have this wonderful ideas, but it's just really hard to do. What Microsoft has done with Viva, specifically with connections, it's much easier. And you could do a whole lot more um, without hiring an army of rock star developers. And then when stuff changes, then you have to figure it out again, right? Right. And I just want to take one thing about the audiences. Audiences really are the key to getting the ultimate value from Viva connections. Audiences are not trivial. First of all, you have to know what ones matter to the organization. And you have to have a way of maintaining those audiences. So you have to identify them and have a way to get an Azure AD group that is continuously maintained to be those audiences. And then besides that, you have to train the people who are publishing pages and news and um, eventually apps as well to know what those audiences are and how they might be used effectively. That is a non-trivial exercise. Although again, great intranets have always been thinking about, have been designed from the perspective of personas to deliver again, the right information for me where I need it. But um, I think we need to really think as organizations, if we haven't done that already, the time to do it is now. And this is not gonna happen without training uh, as well. So I love all the things you said. I just think we need to be practical and realistic about how we're gonna get there. Last point, which, which is very clear as Sue is describing it. Every organization needs a Sue. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not pitching her services. I mean, certainly- I'll, I'll go for it. Come I'll on. I'll take a commission <laughs> off of it. But what I'm saying is there's somebody who has to be thinking about it from an intentional perspective, right? You know, these are great technologies. Don't get me wrong. Much easier in SharePoint 2003, but you got to step back and, and think about the ramifications of how is information handled? What's the architecture look like? What about retention? Do I have to deal with, you know, regulations like GDPR? Somebody has to think about that stuff. And, you know, let's call a spade a spade. Not a lot of organization have people like that or have committed to invest in, in resources to take care of that. Just want to add one last thing, sorry. <laughs> um, I also think that Viva Connections is super, super inclusive because think about the frontline workers. They're not sitting in front of a monitor every day and Viva Connections bringing an intranet is bringing all the information to them, to their mobile phone, uh, integrated into, into Teams. This is really great. Yeah, I think that last mile that is still, there's still more to come, obviously, with what we've announced with connections from a mobile perspective. We've started to see it just in some early beta that they're letting us uh, try out. And it really brings together a lot of what you're saying. There's some, the wellness information that's coming through that feed. There are the things that are proactively kind of built for us, but targeted. So I see my feed, Chris might see a different feed from the Microsoft IT side. 
and, you know, getting people who aren't sitting uh, at, at the desk or to be frank, for, if you are sitting at your desk, it's still a wonderful experience. I liked a lot of what the, the culmination of I think what all three of you had mentioned was centering still on people. If people are a new term in the term store, even though they're the first term that people should think about being able to have your content, your sites, your experiences aware of who am I speaking to? And maybe to be have one action be, I'm not needing to speak to you. I, I want to have somebody else or some other content represented and put in front of you. Um, hugely important. And if there is that rigor for individual sites and content to have the who should I be speaking to and then have that be a dynamic experience that resonates with the individual because they're seeing what's most relevant to them. Big goal, obviously, that we've been putting out there. Implementation is a huge part of that. And as you've seen, you've all said, that's what you wanted 20 years ago. So maybe it takes a little while to get it right. Last up on the on the docket for Viva is Viva Learning. Asif, I know that you're an expert in the community about learning, you know, your company offerings with Visual SP have really always been an integrated learning service distributed throughout N365. So with that as your lens to analyze this, how do you see Viva Learning sort of plugging into the need to sort of establish a learning culture and making sure that you're not just creating information, but it's really being consumed, absorbed, and has an impact on the way people do their everyday work? I've been researching, digging in, and speaking a lot on Viva Learning, actually. And uh, as I dig more and more into Viva Learning and just the learning strategies, as you mentioned, Chris, I've been thinking about this thing and talking about this thing for a long, long, long time. Uh, more and more information comes to mind as to what the real challenges are. And, and I'll describe some of those things. And please, if you guys have any feedback, I'd welcome that as well. There's this survey, I believe Microsoft was part of that survey also that uh, was sponsored talking about what are the main challenges that people feel. And one of the main things that people said out there was, employees said, was that we need access to more training. We want more training. That's been everywhere in the world that's that's come out. And then I was thinking, <laughs> when you think about more training, what, what are people really saying? They don't have access to training? Is that really true. I've worked with hundreds of organizations, hundreds over the years now, and everywhere that I've gone, they have provided some sort of training within some hub. You know, if it's SharePoint that they have, then they have a SharePoint learning hub for internal training content. And uh, well, internet provides us access to additional content. So I go to YouTube a lot to learn. I go to LinkedIn Learn when I need to learn over there. I go to Pluralsight. I have a subscription to Pluralsight over there and many other places that I can find. So is access to learning really a challenge was the question that I was asking myself. And the answer, I think, is pretty obvious that it's not really access to content because we actually have too much content these days and more is being produced every single second. I mean, by the time that we started this podcast to now, there's been terabytes, and I'm not even sure exactly, pentabytes or more contents that have already been put out there in video and other kind of content. So that's not the problem. It's about context. How do I get context in, in at my moment of need when I'm thinking about something? How do I get help? there and then. And I believe Viva Learning really solves for that. So it's a learning hub. It's also a search engine for all the learning content that uh, I would have accessible to me as an individual from my company, through my company. And that learning content could be locally produced by my uh, team and they're putting it in SharePoint and making it accessible through Viva Learning and or it's access to content from our organization through LinkedIn Learning, uh, Microsoft Learn, Pluralsight, Skillsoft, and so many others that I uh, you know that can go on and on on that. And also integration to other systems, which I'm not usually going to as a user. So maybe I'm not going to the LMS as often as I should be. Well, that content can also be brought to me in Viva Learning. And the way I look at it, at the end of the day, we have been expecting users to go to the learning. So it's the learner going to the learning. And now we are bringing the learning to the learner in context of where they are. As we talked about before, Teams is obviously one of the 
main applications where it has grown like wildfire over the last year or so, and even before that. So people are already there. Why not give them information where they are right there as as first jumping off point? And that's what Viva Learning is doing. And you talked about Visual SP. That's true that we've been thinking about this thing for a long time as well, just the whole workflow learning, the learning in the workflow paradigm. And also, how do we bring context closer to to the people. So we expand on that even further saying, okay, so when the user is in Teams, they get all the information within Teams. When they go to outside of Teams, we, we talked about SharePoint, OneDrive, Yammer, Planner, Dynamics even, and others. What about when they're in that context? How do they get access to the same training and more? So we bring the same training over there as well in context of their environment, wherever they are. Uh, so we truly believe in a holistic view of taking the learning, not just the learning, but even beyond that, any information, policy communication, governance, or anything else to the people where they are. And I believe Viva Learning is going to expand more and more. It's not in general availability yet, as you guys know, but when it does come, is going to start from where it is currently and it's going to expand from that to truly become that vision of the central learning location uh, that I think Microsoft is going for, where you will start your journey in Viva Learning and go from beyond that. You know, the context that you mentioned that is really the the value is something that, you know, knowing your product and your service that you've offered for many years, Visual SP, I think one of the biggest components was to offer it where you might be looking, which was, if I remember correctly, when you go to the help context of SharePoint. Yeah. And within that help, you would see more help because there there is some, a lot of training that you've built that's very specific to SharePoint or, or other. You got it. And if you get that context right, which I think is, has been a goal of Viva Learning, but I think it's also just a goal of learning, the lowercase l, is you know when you need it, it's there, and you shouldn't have to go hunting for it. Uh, the one other little thought when you mention the word context that I think is a really nice feature of learning, if you layer it on just a feature, is the ability to share a learning. So the best context that I've gotten recently is when my manager shared something that she thought was important to the team. So she shared it not just to me, but to our team. And and it may be, you know, one additional task that I would put onto my plate that, you know, I need to find time for the learning. But because it was something that my manager who knows my business, who knows our business and knows the context of maybe the value of this learning already, that coming as a link of something that I should watch, get trained on, you know, take some take some time to do was additional context that, you know, I didn't even need to think about it. I just needed to make time for it. Makes a lot of sense. Another thing that um, I just thought about right now, Ducks, you mentioned context switching. This comes into play where if you're switching your context from where you are to where the learning is, time gets lost, motivation gets lost, and so much other effort that you put into going into that deep work scenario all gets lost. So the less context switching you're doing, the better. Wherever you are, you have the information you need to as far as the end users are concerned, to do their job, not learning for the sake of learning, but to help them do their job. I want to jump on that and expand that context switching concept further, right? So a few years ago, I was quite frustrated, especially when I'm advocating for SharePoint, you know, don't send that attachment and just send me a link. It doesn't quite work because if you look at folks, and other than it's so easy to email an attachment, even today, right? We're all hooked to our mobile devices. I, I watch folks like my family alone. I've trained them on using Office 365 consumer, but they still text me pictures. They still share Word documents via chat or messaging tools. And it dawned on me, it, it's not because that they can't learn or they don't understand, but it's that context switching, even even as simple as going to OneDrive on your phone, upload that picture, and then share that link, it's too much. They just want to drop it in this family chat group we have, or even at work, a chat group at work, just drop the file there. And then what's brilliant now, especially with Teams, is yes, people do that, but guess what? It sits in SharePoint or it sits in OneDrive. And it's no different with Viva where it makes it tighter much more because now it's bringing all the other elements of your day-to-day -day experience in your work environment. So if we purposely switch context and move from, you know, a lot of the best practices and good things to think about, and certainly the, the value of 
where has Microsoft come based on, I think a lot of the feedback that we've gotten from you and our customers that says, you know, you're doing the right thing, but it needs to be X. And year after year, we've, we've made those improvements. But when it comes to the realities of implementation, and when it comes to the realities of what does a customer really want out of this thing, it's going to bring some challenges. Uh, and that could be legacy challenges that are still there. It could be new challenges that have been introduced with Viva. But if we take the best practices out of your head that would land on maybe something that people shouldn't do or should be very aware of before they do do, um, we want to go to each of you kind of sticking with the modules that you've you've been at least highlighted at this podcast on as, as the subject matter expert for, of something that's been a red flag that was raised early that you see that should be a learning to others. Um, And Robert, want to start with you when you think of insights, uh, be it the underpinnings of my analytics, workplace analytics, or just implementing insights. What is a challenge specific to insights that people should know about? Yeah, very important red flag, a thing that you shouldn't do. I will come to this later. (laughs) Um, But first of all, if it's about to establish um, the tool first, and usually uh, what we found out uh, is when people say, oh, no, we don't do this because... uh, we cannot collect data or so. This no is just because of a uh, lack of knowledge. So therefore, we call it empower the decision makers to really clearly communicate uh, what is Viva Insights, what is uh, um, workplace analytics doing in the background, that everything is anonymized. You cannot identify specific persons. Uh, you have a minimum group of uh, starting from five or even 10 people, or you can say collect them to 20 or even more people only then um, and bring us a result. So all this information are simply mostly not there at the um, level of decision makers. And this is what they need to know to have a better understanding and then to understand, okay, there's nothing to worry about. Then let's focus on the benefits. What is value that we can get out of it? And before you get into the really red flag, I want to particularly at a layer that you are from and and do a lot of work in Germany, where historically the German privacy laws may be no different than a lot of other countries, but are specifically, you know, a little bit more rigorous than some other countries. You know, is that is that something that if it is viewed as a privacy law, the implication is that there is some law that enforces it. But with that empowerment, is that commonly the conversation? It's not really something you can't do. It's people. It's something that people feel they, they shouldn't do. Yes, this is a red flag. <laughs> okay, so, okay. <laughs> well made. Yeah, this is actually really the thing that you should really not do to not include this working council or the regarding departments who take care of the uh, employees. And uh, if maybe some uh, performance is measured or something like this. So um, this happens and everything tried to be set up. And then anyhow, they found out, oh yeah, there's something happening without us. And this was a big, big fail because yeah, this uh, should this kind of topic with sensitive data that, uh, as I said, uh, how people work, with whom they work and so on. Um, this was then simply um, yeah, a big desi- a disaster to, um, to solve that in the end. So therefore, this is a red flag you should definitely not do. So therefore, always include at the beginning Beginning when also talking to decision makers, also empower these um, working councils. In regards to the laws that you said, uh, I was digging deeper into the laws of Germany, and there is actually uh, a task written down in a law that they have to uh, yeah, request changes when this helps the company and the employees. So actually, they have to deploy (laughs) Viva Insights because it's really helping both. But the reality looks different, uh, unfortunately. They are putting too much uh, importance on these um, data collection. uh, And this comes back then to really um, clarify there's nothing to analyze individuals. It's just about um, the group. Okay. Well, we're going to connect with our PMM peers and say, we should go to Germany and it's a, it's by law, you have to implement Viva Insights. I like that. I like that. <laughs> and Robert said so. So, but uh, I certainly important, you know, the big red flag of in, being inclusive of all stakeholders, especially ones that, you know, have a say in, in how employee data in however they perceive it needs to be reviewed. So that's, that's really good. So there's one last hint to this maybe, because when you have some problems with the working council or some other departments to try to Um, We found out if a company has an innovation department, 
these departments usually go ahead doing a POC and something like this. And these are then the regarding champions or some, some um, people who simply knows more about and then can um, yeah, share this information with the working council, with the decision makers and so on, because they found out themselves there's nothing to worry about. There are only benefits that the company can, can use of. So, Ducks, if we take that lens of innovation, councils, challenges with insights, when you look at challenges that you at least raise any red flag, one or two or three, uh, about implementing connections, things to think about before you even do X or Y, uh, that innovation brings a lot, but it also brings what challenge when you think about it? Sure. So at least from the past couple of months, what I've seen in this challenge is temporary. While connections brings a lot of good uh, opportunities to connect and streamline the flow of work. The rollout of Viva Desktop Connections Desktop, for example, is still programmatic. And then, as you mentioned, you're still using the beta mobile version because that, I think, will be a total game changer. So up until then, uh, I think uh, for now, don't oversell it in your organization. Say, oh, you can start using mobile device and you can do this and that. It's coming. So you, you, you temper that. But at the same time, don't stop rolling out. Start with the pilot, start playing around with it and start getting use cases. So once those capabilities are widely available, especially the mobile device, as Rob highlighted, where now you can reach the frontline workers or your colleagues not using your traditional computers, then it's ready to go. If my quick follow up just on that specific challenge, if you were to mirror it to what you would have said five years ago when a company is getting ready to roll out their company portal, if if that is you know one lens that Connections represents and there is a mobile component that they're planning for, does Connections uh, mirror that uh, new challenges? Does it does it limit or lessen anything? No, I think the comparison is nowhere near the challenges from five years ago. I think we're, we're just spoiled today, frankly, from Microsoft with all these new innovations and even all these mobile apps between Outlook and Teams. It just works, it's fluid. It, it works across different uh, devices. So the fact that I know Viva was ideated and innovated and finalized during the pandemic and it was rolled out quickly, that alone is impressive. But as you know, your audience would always want something now, right? Oh, I saw on the PowerPoint or on the video, I want that mobile app now. Then holding them back and, and making sure that they understand it's coming, you know, you just have to wait and it's not gonna be too long. Yep. Yeah, I just wanna you know, comment on that a little bit. So it definitely was shaped and accelerated a bit by the pandemic, but the roots of Viva, like go back, you know, several years. So it's interesting to kind of see how the pandemic sort of created a crucible for us to pressure test um, a lot of those rollout things. But I think that's totally fair and valid. Asif, we'd love to get your thoughts on what do you see as challenges for organizations that are looking to adopt Viva Learning? Yeah, I feel we might make the same mistakes instead of making new mistakes. And I'm, I'm a big fan of making new mistakes and not old mistakes that have already been learned. So what I mean by that is when learning is designed with a uh, learner in mind and not just the organizational goals in mind, it's a lot more effective. You have to see what am I trying to accomplish? What am I trying to do with this? Is it so people can get cool badges and have certificates that I've done this course or be able to just you know brag to their friends that uh, they, they have, they're an expert in this particular thing because they've done three courses in that while they've done two? Hopefully that's not the goal. The goal is to have the learner take that learning and perform at their moment of need. So there's a concept of performance support, which within our community, I found that to still be new while outside of it, it's a very, very well-known you know, paradigm that you want people to be able to perform at when they need something and, and that learning should, should be available for them to perform that it's, you know, so they can do their job. So can we talk about that a little bit? There's a lot of guidance that we've heard, seen and offered about how a learning rollout should match organizational priorities. And we've seen this yeah. before that the company's determined we need to be more customer focused and let's get, you know, let's make sure there's 
classes on building customer empathy or compliance needs and so forth. That there's a top-down approach. And it sounds like you're recommending something that's kind of different from that. No, it's not really different. There's an augmented you know, method that could be done, that should be done. Planning for the whole thing is super important. That's, once again, that's a mistake I think that many organizations have made in the past where they just throw training or throw information and say, all right, well, I'm done, checkbox check. And I, I've learned this from Sue, actually, that planning is very, very important. You know, when you talk about information act, architecture planning all the time, Sue, I, I always get that sense that, yes, it's so true. You can't just jump into projects. You, you have to. Uh, so planning in this case is not just saying that Viva Learning by itself is my checkbox that I've checked and I'm done. That's macro learning. That's the initial thing that I'm putting out there. And of course, ongoing also, but these are things that people are diving into and they're getting their macro learning done through that. But you have, you have to remember, and I'm sure you all are aware that the forgetting curve is very, very real. You know, there's been lots of research done on it. And I believe in my own life also, when you are learning something and you're going deep inside of it, a week, two, and a couple months after, you not remember every single thing that you've learned. 80% of information is usually forgotten shortly after when you've learned it. So then there's this macro learning. And if you could see me, of course, most people will not be able to see me, but I'm kind of you know, going up in a curve saying, okay, you, you have a macro learning event whatever it is, class, webinar, et cetera, you learn that information. How do you try to retain that information in the mind? There is actually a methodology for that too. It's called spaced learning. You space things out and you provide spaced learning in a micro contextual way. Uh, what I like to call it is contextual micro learning, context sensitive micro learning delivered in a spaced learning method. So you're constantly reminding people, all right, this is how you do it. This is how you do it. And, or you're giving them clues on the page or clues in, in, uh, in their interface as to here's how you would go about doing that task. And then, of course, it becomes more of a practiced learning. So then you can do it without thinking about it much. And, and all that stuff, uh, I look at it as a blended learning solution, a comprehensive solution that you have, which is mic macro learning, which is definitely important, but also the micro contextual learning, which is also super important for that forgetting curve to not take effect and, and you forget about how you do your job. So, so that's my, at least from my humble opinion, uh, the right way of doing it. And I hope companies remember that when they're planning out their training and learning solutions. So the success of Viva Learning is all due to Sue because of planning. That's what I, that's what I heard. That's the 20% of that I retained of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I almost imagine that you will soon be producing, if not already, training on how to do training in the context of this new way that people can set up training, which is not only the how to set up the system, but the ways that people learn, I think, is, is hugely important. So but to, turning to Sue as part of our plan was to talk to Sue about the challenges of topics, of which there's probably only one. I, I know topics doesn't have a whole lot of complexities to it. So whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Sue, when you when you look at uh, challenges of approaching truly implementing Viva topics to the benefits of great engagement of content where you are or however you might frame it. What is that one or two challenges uh, that you would highlight for warnings or as red flags to customers about Viva Topics? So I think I'll reiterate what Duck said is that, and although Viva Topics, when it was announced as part of Project Cortex, is the vocabulary has been around for the, a long time, along with the slideware, not all of those features are available yet. And so being careful not to oversell all the different places topic cards show up. And so being very realistic about that. And so I think that's number one, I'll just echo what Duck said. And then sort of number two, when you're deploying Viva Topics, and by all means, I think you could do it now. I do think you do wanna think about governance. Are you gonna crowdsource the topic information or are you going to assign curating those topics to a core group of knowledge managers? And I can, you know, I can see the pros and cons of both approaches, although I may, you know, my experience has been that at least initially, you may want to limit it to a core group of knowledge managers, both for visualizing uh, topics and curating them so that when you go broad, 
there is a much, you have already thought about what kind of guidance do you have to give to people about what should, what should you do on the topic page? How should you think about editing it? We've learned a little bit about, oh, you probably should give people some guidance about expectations about like who should be declared as, who should you pin as an expert and what kind of documents should you pin? And, you know, what do you do with suggestions that are not necessarily relevant? So thinking through the guidance and relevance in your organization um, I, you know, I, I'm leaning towards at least limiting it initially, but once you've got that guidance available, I think you'll get your best outcome uh, by crowdsourcing. And so the, figuring out that balance and that evolution of your governance model, I think is sort of something you do want to think about. And if I have to use this word again, plan first. <laughs> And it sounds like the planning that Chris, specifically around topics, has a few things to implement still, which I think is a highlight of great planning from the the product team and obviously in the marketing and everything that Chris put together. There's a lot to topics, a lot more to come. But I think the the knowing the challenges of, of where to start and roles that play into it, that they may be defined differently, you may call them differently, but knowing that there are people that are thinking through how how is this product going to represent our stuff and can I do something about it because it's important that it's represented right, I think is is really key. You know, I am mindful that topics sort of has first mover disadvantage <laughs> in that, but being the, the first product officially out, Um, You know, we launched it with the vision statement of our intent about what all four modules would look like in the future coming together. And we're executing on that to get those capabilities coming in. But Sue, you're totally right. Like, we haven't shipped topic highlights showing up inside of Teams chats yet. I will note, we are running it internally in dog food. So it's not vapor, it's coming. And that's, you know, a, a really wished for feature. You know, you have to balance that against, you know, what, and I, I, I quote you differently, Sue, but like you've said many times about like create a vision of where you want to be and then work backwards to how do you get there? The, with the end result being how do we get knowledge deployed and discoverable using the tools as they are, construct a plan that helps you get there. So we are entering the late innings. See, obligatory sports reference always. <laughs> so this is supposed to be a lightning round. Uh, Quick question, quick answers. You know, a best tip for how to use Viva, whether it is aimed at the information worker, at a decision maker, an IT pro. Any module is fair game. Ducks, let's start with you. All right, Viva Connections, make sure you integrate your line of business system like HR tools, HR systems. Terrific. Asif. Uh, My advice would be don't be afraid. Do it. You know, you can always undo I feel some organizations are kind of just, you know, waiting. You don't have to wait. You can always go back if needed. Terrific. Sue? And I'd say understand your target audiences and key content first, and then prioritize towards experiences and topics to bring that value. So I think maybe a big value for a small audience seems better to me than a limited or no value to a broad group. Tremendous. Robert? I would say brace, focus, and meet. So Use from my inside this meditation and uh, save the focus time, and then also use the um, meeting culture dashboards uh, from the event sites to improve uh, yeah, your meeting culture. Mark. I, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, I've had learning shared with me, but I think a great feature in line with the chat, you can use a part of learning that's like a little mini chat app. And you can go in and do a full search of all learning and share it to a colleague. So give it a try, you know, find some training that you liked. And then in the context of a chat, send them that learning. Chris, you've got to have something topics related that nobody knows about. It's a great tip. I'm not going with topics. I'm going also with insights. (laughs) Use the state connected feature inside of personal insights because it's, it shows you um, key collaborators that are recommended from the graph. And it reminds you to respond to them or to schedule time with them to make sure that your work gets protected before your calendar gets filled up with lots of other things to do. And I try to check in on that function at least two or three times a week. I, I reiterate that one. It's like a big running automatic AI to do based on everything that you've done. So it's, it is really cool to everybody. Uh, wrapping up just here, thinking about all the pluses, 
the challenges, tips and tricks. If we are in a virtual intrazone elevator and we're going back down to the lobby, we're getting ready to disperse out into the wind to our modern work uh, places to do what we were doing. Just before the doors bing bong and we run, if you could give us each your 30 second, don't forget this about Viva. It's the last thing you might say if you were to wrap up a Viva breakout session at an event. Sue, what do you say? I'd say use your Viva journey to ensure that you bring the right people together, the right teams together, HR, comms, IT, quality, KM, so that you're really focused on people experiences. People, people, people. Asif. So (laughs) I think Viva brand is just the beginning right now. It's not the end. The four apps is not done. These are great entry points for the experience that you already have access to many of them. And now it's all coming to Teams. Having said that, I don't believe the browser is going away. I've had people ask me, does that mean everything has to be done in Teams? No, you have the internet still in Teams, in the browser, and that will remain and many other functions will remain. So it's a good comprehensive way of looking at it. But yes, a lot of employee experiences have been and will continue to come through the Viva brand within Teams. And uh, lastly, remember, in my humble opinion, that providing relevant learning, since I'm focusing on learning here, providing relevant learning, even if it's concise, is a lot more important to do it in context than to do lots of training that's out of context. There's a lot of innovation for the web. There's a lot of innovation for teams. And there's a lot of innovation, I think, for, for ways that learning brings it closer to the individual Robert, your last pitch as you're as you're exiting the elevator. I would say um, use the power of data for the good. So across all the modules to uh, put the employee there into the center and yeah, get with all the data or the focus uh, that you get uh, through all modules, you um, yeah, will just simply create a competitive innovation advantage. And uh, this is for the users and for the company. Nice. Ducks, we are at the fifth floor, the fourth, the third. Go. Viva is the nexus of your employees' work experience. Excellent. We are culminating many, many large brains, subject matter expertise. And if you've kind of read through and listened, I think what everybody has said, it is not just new news and new learnings. It's really a culmination of a lot of what these MVPs have invested in for many years that I think translates to what our customers have invested in. And I think it's a really important part about Viva and about what you've said. It's not a it's not a right turn away from what we've been doing. We being the collective of how we're growing our internet and our mind share. Uh, but really do thank you all for your time, your expertise, both on the podcast, we thank you, uh, but also out in the world, sharing your knowledge and information out, uh, sometimes uh, at no additional cost, just because you know it's the right thing to do. And of course, with your individual customers one-to-one with their specific needs. So thank you for the time on the Interzone and thank you for everything you do out in the world. If you've just listened to our um, MVP panel roundtable, you may want to participate in that discussion yourself. The good news is there is a tremendous community out there, and that community gathers at events. And so these are some of the events where you may be able to chat one-on-one or in small groups with some of our panelists or with many of the other people who make up our community around the world. The next event coming up is Commsverse, September 15th to 16th, 2021. This is a Teams-based community event being held in the UK, and it's going to be a hybrid event, both in person and online, focusing on Teams along with the rest of Microsoft 365. Just around the corner from Commsverse is SharePoint Fest DC. And to note, there's also a dedicated Teams Fest that's co-located. It's really part of the same event. It's a dedicated Teams track. This will be September 20th through the 24th. And this is in person, as it sounds, in Washington, D.C. Coming up in about a month, um, HR Tech Conference 2021. This is running September 28th to October 1st at the Mandalay Bay Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is a live event. Microsoft is taking a fairly substantial presence at this event with all of the required social distancing and masking and 
health conventions, but we're there to talk about the value of employee experience and what it means with our HR audience. You know, there's a lot of folks who look at Microsoft through an IT lens, but we think that people-centric view is an equally important way to describe and accelerate the value that you get with Viva. So that'll be coming up in late September. Yeah. And just to lean in on this one just a little bit more, uh, Chris, I just saw the sketch up of what the booth will look like and it looks really nice. And it represents a lot of what you and the Viva team are doing and a lot of what the team's team is doing. And to lean in just that little more that that we've got a pretty broad overview session with Seth Patton, a couple of nice demo sessions to really get hands on on what Viva is. And then a little teaser for the IntraZone audience. There will be a special IntraZone episode all about HR that we're working on right now. After HR Tech, October, we're going to creep in two more events just to give a lens on what's coming in a few months. But a big one is Collab Days New England. This is an in-person event, and there are two people, Jeff Teeper and Chris McNulty, that I want to highlight alongside a lot of great other speakers as they're finishing up what they're going to be, uh, the full agenda. Uh, But Chris, I want to ask you one question, but right before, I just want to tell everybody, if you haven't seen Jeff Teeper's a tweet specific about collab days. He has got an awesome t-shirt that he's built. And I don't want to say too much more about what the shirt is for and what the shirt looks like, but it's really cool. We'll make sure to put that in the show notes. But Chris, you're going to be there. Collab days, New England. Little nugget of what you're planning and what your thoughts are. Basically subjecting myself to torture at the end of the event. Um, I have closed that event for a number of years. They haven't held it in two years. Um, Just to walk through a couple of top of mind things, which I won't need to do because they will have had that from Jeff. But usually it's sort of a recap, uh, open Q&A around the room. And since I've done it three or four years in a row, there's a fair bit of, hey, a year ago you said this and what's happened with that and so on and so forth. So I have to definitely make sure that I'm, um, up to speed on everything that um, we're doing across the breadth of M365, but that's... Sounds like an Ask McNulty Anything. It basically is. <laughs> Round us out with the last uh, event, SharePoint Fest Dallas. Yeah, SharePoint Fest Dallas coming up mid-October. Uh, this is going to be an in-person event. Uh, Mark and I um, are not necessarily doing the intro zone. We are co-keynoting that event. So we'll have details on all of those events, more in the show notes if you're looking for more information. So that's it. We've wrapped another episode of The Intro Zone. Of course, we'd like to thank Doc, Sue, Asif, and Robert for their insights into best practices for Viva deployment and adoption. We'll put links to everything that we talked about with them and everything we shared with events into our show notes and into the Intro Zone blog. To find out about any show, you can go to our show page at aka.ms slash The Interzone, especially if you're looking for that one episode with Jared when we talked about him on 101 Microsoft Viva. It's on that page. In case you're curious about other Microsoft shows and why wouldn't you be, check out aka.ms slash Microsoft slash podcasts. You can email us anytime at theinterzone at microsoft.com or find us on Twitter, tweet us, DM us, chat with us at SharePoint, at mcashman, and at cmcnulty2000. Word of mouth is still the best way people learn about podcasts. So if you enjoy this show, help us help more people. Share that SharePoint love and follow the show at your local ballpark or wherever you get your podcasts. We are your hosts, Mark Cashman and Chris McNulty, and you've been listening to The Interzone, a show about the Microsoft 365 Viva Las Viva intelligent intranet.